Well, I titled the sermon, Why We Love the Cross. Why We Love the Cross. And uh, each of you should have received, uh, as we handed out on your way in, uh, a little olive wood cross. And this is, uh, this is straight from the little town of Bethlehem. This is genuine Holy Land olive wood. And uh, this is a gift for you and an illustration of a sermon. I want you to, to take this with you, hold on to it. Um, I was hoping to find them small enough that you could keep in your pocket maybe through the week um, so that you have just a, a, a reminder that, that you can feel and see that will point your attention to the cross. Point your attention to the cross. There is something beautiful about the cross. Have you ever wondered why the day that Jesus was crucified we refer to as Good Friday? Good Friday? Why do we say that? That was a terrible day. It was a horrific day, a devastating day, and yet we call it Good Friday. Or, if you consider the cross here, when I first came, there wasn't a cross, and I didn't know where to look when I was preaching. I I kept looking around like, we got to have a cross here, because this, this, my friends, is the focal point of our worship, isn't it? So we got this wood from a a hundred-year-old barn that was being torn down in Linden and uh, had an, uh, a guy in the church make this for us. And so this is not only um, you know, rooted in our, in our county, but this is a pointer to the very roots of our, of our hope and our salvation. Why is the cross beautiful? Why do, why do when we look at it, we worship and, 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 and stand in awe of the wonder of God's love? Let me put, put the question to you this way. How could a brutal Roman torture device become so loved that it would be worn as jewelry? Okay, now just pause here. How many of you are wearing a cross around your neck this morning? Okay, let me see your hands. Yes, good. Good. No, you're not in trouble. <laughs> this is good. It's good. I wonder sometimes in our world how many crosses are worn without a thought to what it means, what it represents. How could a brutal Roman torture device become so loved that it would be worn as jewelry, placed prominently in our homes? How many of you have a cross that is on display in some way, shape, or form in your, in your house? Show of hands. Okay, there we go. How about when we gather, we sing about the cross? It is well. Did you catch that? Did you, did you catch how cross-centered that song is? So many of our songs speak about the cross. And that it would become the focal point in our worship. Now, this, this imagery here is horrific to consider When our Savior died, he he died a brutal, suffering, horrible death. And yet, when we look at the cross, we see beauty and wonder and awe, and we worship. What I want to do today, both for the cross that you take home with you and for the cross here on the stage, as you sing, I would encourage you, look at the lyrics and look at the cross. And be reminded of all of the truths that we're going to see today in just these two verses. These two verses, I want to slow down. Now, we've been moving through 1 Peter, uh, not at a fast pace. Some would say, wow, we, we mean slow down. Okay, no. Just two verses, though, today. I want to go slowly through these as a standalone sermon because I don't think we could emphasize this focus enough for the Christian life. This, this is critically important, a focus for you, both for your salvation and for everyday growth and joy in Jesus Christ. So let's look at the heart of the gospel. You'll see what I did with verse 24. I broke it into three parts, and I'm taking the first part and the last part and putting them together because they speak to the same theme here. We're going to do the middle part in the next section. So at the very heart of the gospel is the cross. The cross is at the very heart of the gospel. Listen to how Peter writes it. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree 
And then he says, by his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, you have been healed. These are amazing words. These are words you, you can't just read through and, and, just, and just move on. You've got to stop here. Even though they're familiar words, there is tremendous value for us to slow down and say, okay, now let's just, let's just sit here for a while and consider this. If you've been a Christian for a long time, the familiarity of the cross and, and the message of the cross and the work of Jesus Christ can become something so familiar that you, you actually don't feel the impact as you ought. I grew up in the church, and, and I've heard countless sermons on this, and yet as I slowed down this week, there was something that the Lord did in my heart to just cause me all the more to, to stand in wonder at the, the amazing plan of God to bring salvation to me through the torture and brutal death of my Jesus. He himself bore, he bore our sins, our sins, in his body on the tree. And then you think about why he calls it the tree. The tree. If you do a study, there's a, there's a book that does this. It goes through and it starts with the tree, right? You remember the tree? The tree is a huge deal in the scriptures. The tree in the garden. How'd that go for us? Not great, right? That's where sin entered the world. That's where we rebelled against God. And then you track your way through all of these moments. And for the tree, or most literally the wood, as it were, the wood, he was nailed onto the wood to show up as the centerpiece of the gospel. And then at the end of the story, remember, the tree that stands and and, and grows these beautiful fruits in season and, and is, is for the healing of the nations. Forever we will be in view of the tree. So the tree is a big deal to the Lord. By his wounds you have been healed. Let's just work our way through this and consider some of these things. First of all, at the very heart of the gospel is what theologians refer to as substitutionary atonement. Okay, now at Christian you need to know this phrase. You need to know what these words mean. More than that, you need to love what these words mean. Substitutionary. That's not hard to catch. What does it mean? Well, a substitute, atonement. One who takes my place and pays my debt. Substitutionary atonement is that Jesus, as my substitute, took the place that I deserve and then satisfied fully the wrath of God that I should have paid. Instead, he paid it on my behalf. Substitutionary atonement. Sin must be punished by God. As I said last week, every single sin ever committed in the history of mankind will be punished by God. That is never a doubt. God is holy. He is good. He is just. He can never say, oh, it's no big deal. Just forget about it. It'll be fine. No, that's not who our God is. He cannot compromise his holiness. He won't do it. Well, then how does he forgive? He forgives by putting that punishment on his son instead of on me. Sin must be punished by God, which means that for us as sinners here, everyone, by the way, in the room, we're all sinners, all of us. Substitution is our only hope. It's either substitution or hell. That's, that's the reality. There are only two options. And the good news, this is the good news that we carry to the ends of the earth. We tell people that there is a substitute who has joyfully, willingly laid his life down to pay for sin such that all who believe in him can be delivered from the fires of the wrath of God and saved. Substitution is your only hope. You can see how Peter moves through Isaiah 53. Peter is a Jew. He's a believer with a Jewish background, I should say. He is a man who knows well Isaiah 53, and I am convinced that Jesus taught him 
thoroughly in this chapter after his resurrection. I, I, I am convinced of it. The more I read in the New Testament, the more I see these, these themes come up, especially as he pointed to the law and the prophets and opened their eyes to all the things. They had no idea how he was fulfilling each of these pieces along the way. Even though he was telling them, they missed it still. Isaiah 53 is in view. Listen to the words here and then listen to the echo in Peter's words as Jesus has fulfilled them. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded. Okay, so we're talking suffering. He was wounded for our sins, our trespasses, our transgressions. He was crushed. Crushed by who? Who crushed Jesus? God the Father crushed him. It was the will of God. In fact, it, it, it said it, that it pleased the Father to crush the Son because of what would come through the crushing of the Son. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. That is where Peter is speaking straight out of. He skipped down to verse 6. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. <laughs> He's the substitute. That's what Peter has in view. And he wants us to go back to Isaiah 53 and connect it to the cross and stand in awe and just consider the implications. Consider what that means. For a Jewish audience, the idea of a substitute sacrifice would have been so ingrained in your family experience, your practice. This was constantly in view. By the time you were an adult, you would have witnessed a lamb bleeding out over and over and over, year after year, constant displays of sacrificing and substitutionary atonement in view. Now, this was to cover sin for the, the, the sins that had been committed, and it required over and over practice. As we saw in Leviticus, my goodness, the blood flowed. God's people were constantly killing animals in obedience to the Lord and, and setting those sins upon that animal as the sacrifice so that their sins might be covered. There was no end to the sacrifices. It's harder for us to feel this. What we, I mean, we don't have little lambs in our home that we get to know and name and cuddle with and then kill because our sin is so serious that God requires blood be spilled. And then as that blood is flowing into the bowl and the life of that little lamb is bleeding out, I'm thinking as a young man, that should be my blood. You see, we don't, we don't have this in our experience. For a Jewish audience, this would have been so vividly just exploding on the scene. It's good for us to be reminded. We don't feel how serious our sin is in our day. We just don't. Our culture doesn't feel this. Our sin is horrifically offensive to God. And we should be struck dead where we stand because of it. We are guilty. We are vile. We should not be forgiven. We should not be loved. This is what makes it amazing. This is why we sing amazing grace. What wondrous love is this, right? This, that's why the cross is beautiful. It's because it's surprising and it's undeserved. He himself bore, he bore our sins in his body on that tree. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus bore our sins. What does it mean to, to bear sin? Well, it's to carry it, but more than that, it means to suffer under it. When you see the spies going into the land, 
They spied the land for 40 days. You remember this? They came back with a report. It was filled with faith, wasn't it? We can do this. Let's go, Let's go in and, and conquer the land. Isn't that what they said? No, it wasn't. They said these guys are scary. They're vast in number. They're huge. We'd be, we'd be beaten down. We'd lose. We shouldn't go in. And God said, for every day that you spied out the land with faithlessness, you will wander for one year. How long did they wander? Bearing their sins in the desert 40 years. God punished them, actively punished them, until all those who were alive in that day had dropped dead. And then their children took the promised land. That's what it, just a little glimpse there, right? This is the same God we worship. That's how big a deal sin is. That, that he could rightly and justly say, if this is what you've chosen, you will bear it. You will carry it unto your death. And then we read this. Jesus bore my sin? Why did he do that? Love. Love. He didn't have to do that. This was the, 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 the gift of God. It's a, it's a freely bestowed gift. He did it because of love. Not because I deserve this love, but because he showed his worth and his value and the glory of his godness in loving rebels and sinners like you and me. He bore our sins. A few verses build this out for us here. Look at the word for especially, for. Don't, don't miss, Jesus wasn't just giving us some example here. Look at the word for. Why did Jesus die? Why did he die? For Christ also suffered. He, why did he suffer? Well, he suffered for sins. Well, whose sins? It wasn't his. He never sinned, as we saw last week. He was without sin. The righteous, that is Jesus, for the unrighteous, that's you and me, that he might bring us to God. Amazing. This is the plan of God. This is the only way that sinners could be in the presence of God forgiven. Substitutionary atonement. You go to Galatians and listen to the, the way Paul words this. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For us. For those who should be accursed. He became a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That's why I think it was so difficult for the disciples to process what was happening. They understood that crucifixion was a display of God's judgment upon the person who was hanged on that tree. And when Jesus was crucified, it, it, they were like, well, he is, he is cursed. And they were right, but not because of his sin of mine he became the curse so that i might be forgiven for our sake key words there for our sake he the father made him to be sin the son who knew no sin there's another claim very clear jesus was without sin he had no sin in his life but god laid upon him my sin so that in him all who believe might become the righteousness of God. We're going to build this out on Easter. What does it mean when Jesus obeyed? And how does that come into my credit, my account? How, how does that bring unbelievable implication for my life? His obedience is now my obedience. That's where we're going to go in April. By his wounds you have been healed. So think of it this way. In love... He died for me. He died for me. Christian, he died for you. His pain was for my gain. His suffering under the wrath of God the Father was, was, was what I deserved. He drank it all. The bitter cup was his to drink, but it should have been mine. He purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. My forgiveness 
is based solely upon his substitute sacrifice. Do you feel that? You've got you to feel that this morning. Just stop and consider how profound that is. Hmm. Is that fair? Sometimes people get caught up in what's fair. It just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair. Well, guess what? That's not fair. Substitutionary atonement is not fair. <laughs> That's, it's not fair for Jesus. It's certainly not fair for me. What, what is fair for the sinner? Fire. That's fair. Justice, wrath, eternal punishment for the rebels, for the sinners against God. That's fair. What this is is grace. That's a gift. That's the kindness, the overflow of God's lavish love. It's amazing. Is it just? Yes. It is just. God is addressing sin with full wrath and vengeance. He punishes it fully, satisfying His holiness and His justice, and at the same time accomplishing forgiveness and freedom for the guilty. Substitutionary atonement. It's incredible. Precise punishment paid in full. Just, sometimes it's good for us to stop here and consider this. He bore my burdens to Calvary, right? Okay, every one. He suffered and died alone. Yes. How marvelous, how wonderful. Absolutely, all of that. It's true. But not just generically. Not just like, I don't know, if you were, were going to throw... Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching here. I'm, I'm trying to go into a baking category, and I'm thinking of throwing sugar for some reason. Um, maybe over some cookies. I don't know where, where that was going. I think I'm just going to leave that one out, and maybe we'll have some cookies this afternoon, babe. <laughs> this is not just some blanket, just, oh, I hope it covers everything. Just Jesus dies for everything, and that'll, hopefully that'll be enough suffering. As if somehow there was... One drop of blood that was spilled beyond what was needed. Think of this. There was no suffering spared and no suffering beyond what was required. He suffered precisely. God is just. He is holy, which means retribution is precise. It is not hopeful or wishy-washy. You don't want a judge who has someone come in for a misdemeanor who, who is like, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to lock you up for life. You, you're going you're to go for life. Or, right, that's, that's over punishment. Or under punishment, slap on the wrist, go out, have fun. I know you meant well, right? That's, that's under punishment. God doesn't ever err in retribution and punishment. Which means, my friend, that the cross is precise. It is a specific atoning work. Every single sin of every single person who will look to the Son in faith and be saved is paid in full. I want you to think of a sin you committed last week. This shouldn't be hard. <laughs> it's not hard. Think of a sin that you committed last week. He died for that. He died for that. Now guess what? This afternoon, that sin that you commit, that you don't see coming right now, he also died for that. Every sin, past, present, and future, Christian, he bled and died for. Under the righteous wrath of God, he suffered for that. This is motivation to obey. This is motivation to holiness. Which is why we have the next uh, section here, the middle of verse 24. The aim of the atonement. You can't, you can't sit for very long considering the suffering and atoning work of Christ in your place and not get to this point. What is the aim of the atonement? He himself bore our sins and his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 
Shall we send it up that grace may abound? In Romans 6, the response was, Meganoito, may it never be. Christians are those who hate sin. And one of the reasons we hate our sin is because we know that Jesus suffered for it. Why would I want to live in it any longer? He died to set me free. I died to sin. I died to sin. And I live to righteousness. I want to bear fruit in keeping with righteousness. I want to be like him. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now there's this thing that's taken place. I remember being in a church where the pastor who uh, is now off the deep end uh, in the weeds we talk a lot about the way of Jesus, okay? I don't know if you guys have, have, have come across this. This is kind of progressive indicators. Like if you hear someone talking, it may, it may not be, but it, it is likely a, a red flag waving. The way of Jesus. Well, the way of Jesus. This is the way of Jesus, okay? If you talk about the way of Jesus as if Jesus is one that we should just copy, he showed us a, a better way. He, he modeled for us the way that we should live. And you don't first go to substitutionary atonement. You got things completely upside down. Why does the progressive church like to talk about the way of Jesus? Well, because it gives an opportunity to do something. It gives you an assignment. Listen, this is how it sounds. Love like Jesus and you'll be loved by Jesus. Jesus gave us the example of love, so as we love like him, he loves us more, which is a masked way of basically saying, perform to be accepted. This is religion. This is not the gospel. This is, this is imitation is atonement. So what do you do if you feel bad for your sins? Well, go do some good stuff. WWJD for a while. Get the bracelet and be a good person so that your sins will be lessened by your deeds and hopefully you'll be good enough to qualify for glory. That is not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Just go be a good person. Be like Jesus. Now, I don't want to overstate this. We, 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 could, we could err... Uh, by correcting this, but let me just say the order is this. Atonement enables imitation. It is atonement that releases us into the freedom of imitation of Jesus Christ. How am I to love like him? I can't do that in myself. I need forgiveness, release from sin. I need atonement. And only Jesus provides that. A once for all sacrifice for my sins paid in full. I need that first. There is no way I have the power to overcome my own rebellion and be like Jesus. By works of the law, no one will be justified in his sight. There is no way you can ever be good enough to overcome the sins you've committed against God. It's impossible. There is one, however, who is, and his name is Jesus. And he paid for all those sins, and he lived in perfect obedience, and he is your only hope. He is your only hope. That is the gospel that is in the Bible, that is clear. It's the same old gospel that generations of believers have been preaching and teaching for hundreds and hundreds of years. It doesn't need adjustment. It doesn't need to be spruced up for the modern day. Atonement is the very core of the gospel. He is my substitute. He's my only hope. If you want to live a good life, you've got to start on your knees at the foot of a cross where the Savior who loves you died to pay for your sins and to release you into obedience. We love because He first loved us. That's the order. There's no way you can switch that around. Well, he loves me because I first loved him. Wrong. That's wrong. It's, it's dead wrong. I love him because he first loved me. I show his love to others because he has radically changed me through his love for me. 
We are called to imitate. We are called then to live this out, to put sin to death and bring good deeds and fruit to life. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now, Christian, there's your assignment for this week. It's twofold, okay? Go on the hunt for your sin. This is a theme that comes up often in the scriptures. I feel like there's so many sermons that have emphasized this in our lives. We need this, don't we? We, we need this. We cannot simply be passive in the work of, well, I guess, there, let me see. I guess that felt like sin. No, it's not enough to do that. I want to look for it. I'm hunting. Lord, show me. Open my eyes. Convict me. I invite your Holy Spirit to, to just burden my soul with guilt when I sin against you. I don't want that. I want obedience. I invite this conviction. Open my eyes. Show me anything in my heart that doesn't align with your righteousness. We die to sin. We confess it, right? We bring it to the cross and we lay it down. Thank you, Jesus, for paying for those sins. Now replace those sins with righteous instincts and righteous responses and and, and the fruit of righteousness that is to flow through our lives. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, don't forget the context that we're studying these verses. This is significant for us. I actually was struck by this, and so I pulled back and I looked at other books, and I found the same thing in Paul. (laughs) It's amazing. In the context of submission, so we've already spent two weeks talking about submission to civil authorities, talking about submission uh, to in the workplace, right? Even when suffering unjustly, submission. And next week, ladies, you get one more week, okay? So like, just, you know, do what you got to do this week because the, the, on Sunday, a week from now, it's coming down. Submission in marriage. That was not a, a, a freedom to sin, by the way. Just, <laughs> just to clarify that. We are in the middle of verses that are all about submission, the freedom of submission that have been released in our lives and commanded by God. We are submitting people. And right in the middle of that, he gives a focus on atonement. Hmm. One of the things that we know about our hearts is that the echo of rebellion is there. And if you want to find how quick your heart will go to that place, put yourself in the context of submission. If you want to find sin and hunt and and put it to death, then open your eyes to the call of Scripture to submission. I'm just struck by this, how both Peter and Paul address submission, uh, uh, they address the gospel in the preparation for the calls to submit. Uh, For instance, Ephesians 5. uh, It's the very same passage where Paul addresses husbands and wives, right? It's a very classic marriage teaching passage. How does that chapter begin? Listen to the call. Be imitators of God as, not so that you will be, but as beloved children walk in love. As Christ loved us, what does that love look like? He gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Atonement enables imitation. So go and live like this. Love the way He's loved you. How do you do it? You build it all out of substitutionary atonement. How are we to joyfully submit, to receive from the Lord His sovereign lead in our life? Substitutionary atonement. It's sourced here at the cross where we humbly bow. And find the strength to obey and the joy to walk in submission according to the Scriptures. Now, let's finish with this, the joy of coming home. The joy of coming home. These are some of my favorite verses in all the Bible. I guess it's just one verse. Listen to verse 25. For you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You were straying like sheep, but you've now returned, or you could say you've now been returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. 
strain like sheep. What does this bring to mind? Any, any shepherds in here? We've got, the, we've got a few people who run sheep. It's interesting. I'm not a shepherd. I've been around sheep very little. So I did some, some work, some research. Why do, why do sheep stray? Okay. Well, one time they, 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 they get afraid very easily. They're, they panic like crazy. And it, when they get panicked, they will just blindly run. In, in the weirdest places, just that lose themselves in fear, and they, they're off they go, right? Another reason the sheep stray is because they're curious. They'll see something over there, and they'll be like, i got to find out what that is. I want to know. Boom, off into the dark. And then up in the briars, they're on their back. Well, I found out what it is. Help, right? <laughs> they stray because, and this happens more often than not, they just blindly follow other sheep. Well, here goes my buddy. He's heading this way. I'm with him. Where are we going? I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> Off into the dark, into the weeds. We're straying. You can have sheep follow one another off a cliff without a thought. Joe jumped. Here we go. <laughs> off the cliff. To their demise. I was struck because deer aren't like this. Deer are graceful. They're, they're tremendously precise in how they land and their hooves. And uh, It's fun to watch deer. Sheep, a little different. Okay? Let me give you an illustration of a, of a sheep. Okay? This sheep has had some problems. He, he got stuck in a ditch, and now he's set free, and he's like, yes, I'm free. Free! <laughs> <laughs> That, that is a sheep. You got to see it again. I'm so glad to be free. Whoa, bam. Okay. Can anyone identify with that? Okay. We were strain like sheep. We were straying like sheep, running into isolation, running into darkness and danger, hungry, afraid, and running toward our demise, foolishly and purposefully, running away from all that was right and good and beautiful. We are rebels by nature. We sin out of who we are. And that is where we were. We were in the dark, fumbling around, face down in the ditch, thinking we were free. Thinking, isn't this great? I do whatever I want. Hmm. What a slavery that freedom was. All we like sheep have gone astray. Where's Peter quoting again? Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's the epitome of sin. That's the epitome of rebellion. Rejecting sovereignty. It's at the very core of our rebellion. I don't want you to be sovereign. I want to be. I'll decide what I do for me. I'll decide where I go, what I like, what I don't like. I choose. And in doing so, we run from the very love and, and, and safety net of the shepherd. How do we return? Here's the answer. The Lord has laid on Him, that is, the Savior, Jesus. We know His name. Isaiah prophesied, what was it, 700 years before Jesus came? He laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. It's every single person who comes to him in faith. Their sins are paid in full. The shepherd and overseer. Uh, the New American Standard uses the word guardian. I like that. The shepherd and guardian. It's the same word that is used in the New Testament for elder or bishop. The shepherd and overseer of your soul, Christian, is Christ. The good shepherd that David wrote about in Psalm 23. 
He's good. Don't run from him. Hmm. What do I deserve? What have I been given in Jesus? At the very core of the gospel are those two significant realities. I stood in front of the memorial service yesterday for Bill Johnson. Bev, we love you. Glad you're here. One of the things that had to be asked yesterday is, why did Bill need a Savior? Why did a man like that need saving? And the answer was clear, because Bill was a sinner too, just like all of us in this room. Bill saw the shepherd by eyes opened by the grace of God, and when he saw the shepherd and he he felt the weight of his sin and offenses, he ran to Jesus with all his might. He returned to his shepherd and found safety and love and grace. Substitutionary atonement. Oh, sinner, come home. I don't know where each and every person is out here, but I can tell you this. If you are weary and you are sick and tired of running, There is a Savior today whose arms are open and He's saying, come home. Come home. Just come. Come to me all who are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest for your soul. Stop running. Come home. Come home. A way has been made for you to return. The price is paid. And the love is held out to the ends of the earth. Come. Come. A response this morning. Do you love the cross? Do you feel how radical the love of God is for you? Let me just tell you this. That cross in your hand points to what your future should be. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve because of my sin, my rebellion. That is, it would be right and it would just be the beginning, wouldn't it? Apart from God's grace, apart from a substitute Savior who lived in obedience and then laid his life down, we deserve wrath. But provision has been made. Do you love the cross? When you see the cross of Jesus, does your heart soar with joy? You say, oh, what a beautiful reminder. What a wonderful cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the price you paid. Hmm. What a priceless gift. Undeserved life. Have I, the sinner... The rebel, the undeserving, been given through Christ crucified. You called me out of death. You called me into life. I was under your wrath. But through the cross, I'm reconciled. Do you love the cross? That's why we love the cross here. That's why we love the cross. That's why it's on our stage. And that's why every time I see it, I am in awe of what Christ has done. So if you wear it around your neck, don't wear it mindlessly. If you hang it from your ears, remember what it means and testify to the good news that it is. When people come into your home, point them to it. Do you know about what that means? Let me tell you what it means. Love the cross. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we delight in You, the God of love, amazing love You have shown us through the sending of Your Son to be our substitute, to substitute Himself to take my sin upon Him and die what I deserved under Your righteous wrath, to pay for my sins once for all. A perfect atonement it was. Precise, not hopeful, not wishy-washy, not spread across some generic 
I wonder if it will save anybody but precise to save your elect, to save them. Oh, Jesus, thank you for being such a shepherd. Thank you for saving us. It is a joy to be under your shepherding care, to be yours. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We love to hear your voice. We love, we love to read in the word and, and hear you speak words of love and, and words of truth and words of correction and words of comfort. Oh, what a shepherd you are. Jesus, our Savior. I pray if there is anyone here today who is tired and weary of the dark, of isolation, of just being buried in sin, sick of trying to be their own sovereign. Oh, God, graciously call them now, I pray. Come, come home. Come and find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins and be returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. His name is Jesus and he is your only hope. We delight in you, Jesus, above all others. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen.